God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. Lord, we honor you today, Father, for you are good and you are God. You are worthy of all the praises, all the glory, and all that we have to give unto you. And we praise you today, Father. We honor you today. We lift you and magnify you, for you are worthy. Father God, there's none like you. You have blessed us. And in spite of us, you've been good to us. Lord, we ask you, Father, to forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for messing up. Forgive us for falling short. Forgive us, Lord, for missing the mark. We ask you to bless us today, Father God, that, Father God, we will be blessed of you in your word, dear Master. We ask you to speak to us through your word. Bless your word to be clear. Bless your word to be relevant. And bless your word to be on target, Father God. We ask you, Father God, to bless us to understand your word, that we will have wisdom that flows through your word. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Praise us. Oh Lord, for your name. And he is greatly to be praised. I sing praises to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Praises. Oh Lord, for your name. And greatly be praised. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We ought to sing praises to his name, for he is worthy. For his name is great and is greatly to be praised. We thank God for blessing us one more time to come to worship and honor him. Another Wednesday night, we are in the Bible. We are on 2 John. 2 John, 2 John. On last week, we realized that we don't have to call out chapters. Why, why don't we have to call out chapters? There's only one spot here, one chapter, if you may call that a chapter. So we are on verse, verse number four through verse number six. Verses four through six is where we are that will finish that first pericope after the introduction that took place on last week. Second John, right near Revelation, back, back to your left, you'll run into second John. Second John. Who's writing the book? Who's writing? Who is the author here? John, John, the apostle John, the one that walked with Jesus. We discovered on last week that he's the apostle John because he was present with Jesus, right? He was present. We have some modern day self-proclaimed apostles. And in order for them to be apostles, they have to be more than 2,020 years old. They have to be more than 2,020 years old in order for them to be apostles. So we have self-proclaimed apostles. But this is a true apostle. He is the apostle John. He walks with Jesus Christ. And as we saw last week, he's talking to a church. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the born again believers in Jesus Christ. He's talking to the church. As he has been talking to the church throughout 1 John, he's talking to the church in 2 John. We also said to you last week that he's talking to the members of the church. When he uses the word children, when he says the elect lady, he's talking to the church. When he says the elect lady in the children, he's talking to the church and the members of the church. So the Apostle John is talking to the church and he, he tells them there are two main factors that you need to realize and you need to walk in these two main factors. Number one, he says you ought to walk in love. Number two, he says you ought to walk in the truth. Love is that that expression that one has for the other that cares for that person. And when we look at the word love, we love people unconditionally, right? Regardless of what they do to us, regardless of what they say, regardless of how they treat us. When we talk about the God type love, we're talking about agape love and we must walk in love. Not respective of who they are. We must, I, I saw a man walking down the street and when I saw him walking down the street, I waved my hand and spoke to him. We have to love even those who have not had a decent shower. We have to love even those who do not have a, a home. We must love even those who stand on the street who beg for money. We must love even those who beg for our money. We must love even the drug addict, the prostitutes. We must love all mankind. And as we love them, God helps us with that love. If you, if you get to a point where you commit to love and you can't love on your own, God has a way of helping you with it. So God helps us with our love. He, he supports us. 
It says that we must abide in the truth in verse number one. In verse number two, because the truth which abides in us will be with us forever. So if you're saved, you're born again, you walk in the truth, you walk in love, and this truth is with you from now on. And because, in verse number three, he, he says to us, because we walk in love, because we abide in the truth, then we have grace, we have mercy, and we have peace. And it will be with us because it comes from God, the Father. It comes from God, the Son. Here he paints another picture of the Father and the Son being one in deity. He paints a picture tonight that that as we walk in the Father, we also walk in the Son. We can't walk in the Son unless we walk in the Father. We can't walk in the Father unless we walk in the Son. So we must walk in the truth. The truth is God's word. And Jesus says like this, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. Life. Back home in Mississippi, because people didn't really know, they would say he, they, he's the light. He is the light. He explains to us that he is the light. But in, in John, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. In other words, you may be living, but you're just existing without the Son, without the Father. So a lot of people are just existing. They they got blood running through their veins. They're inhaling and exhaling. They walk, they talk, they are still living, but they're just existing. If you don't have Christ, you don't have life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When we look at verse number four, John again is talking to this church, right? He's talking to the church. And he says, I rejoice greatly. He says, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. John says, I got excited. He says, I was delighted. He says, it gives me great joy, so much so until I rejoice. When I saw the children of the church being obedient to the truth. He got excited. He delighted. He he rejoiced because he saw the members of the church in obedience to the father, in obedience to the son, in obedience to the truth. He says, he says, I rejoice greatly. He said, he got ecstatic. He he looked at it and he got excited about it. Are you excited about it? Are you excited when you see other believers walking in the truth? Have you ever walked up on a believer and say, look, I'm proud of you. I rejoice because of you. What he's saying is we ought to encourage each other who walk in the truth. Everybody has some little quirks. Everybody has some little problems. But when you see them do one thing right, you ought to be happy about it. That's right. That's right. You know, I always say and I always will say that it, it really it really it really gets my attention when I see folk in church. That really, really look down on other people. Now, it was just yesterday you were out there. It, you just became, I don't care how long you've been saved, it, it's just a, a morsel in the sight of God. But we get saved and two days later we're on fire for the Lord and we look down on other people. Instead, we ought to rejoice when we see one come. Luke chapter 15, in Luke chapter 15, uh, Luke says that when one come to Christ, the angels in heaven throw a block party. The angels in heaven get excited when just one person comes to Christ. 
Just one. When just one come to Christ, we ought to throw a roof changing party. We ought to rejoice when one come to Christ. So he says, I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth. And this truth is as it was commanded from the Father. It is the commandment of the Father. We ought to walk in God's commandments. Where can we find the commandments? In the truth, in the word of God. We ought to walk in the Father, walk in the truth, so much so to other people can see it. If you have to announce that you're born again, if you have to announce that you are a Christian, if you have to announce that you are a Christian, you have to wonder, is your testimony very strong? People ought to see it. John says, I found that your members were walking in the truth. And that gave me excitement. One reason why we ought to reach souls for Christ is because we want to get excited about people going to heaven when they die. And it's our job to make sure that we do all we can to testify of the goodness of God, to testify of Jesus' salvation, his story, so we can make sure that God utilizes us to get as many folk in heaven as possible. As many as possible. Your neighbors, your relatives, your associates, your friends, your enemies. You want to make sure that you present Christ in your lifestyle. See, we always talk about several types of evangelism. Two of them that I will point out today is verbal evangelism, where you actually share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then there's something called frangelism. It is where your lifestyle reflects Christ. And people know you are a Christian because of how you live from day to day. So your, your lifestyle ought to exemplify love. Your lifestyle ought to exemplify that you're following the truth because you don't get so bent out of shape over every little thing. The things that got on your nerve last week ought not get on your nerve this week. And certainly the thing that got on your nerve six months ago ought not get on your nerves this week. We ought to be growing. We ought to be growing. We ought to be growing. This past Sunday, Pastor Murray Martin at the Holman Street Church talks about growing and he talks about getting off meat and uh, getting off milk rather and getting on meat. He said, I want to speak to you spiritually, but but I really can't do it. He said, I want to tell you of God's goodness. I want to serve you meat. I want to serve you higher level stuff, but I can't do it because you you won't grow up. Everything gets on your nerves. Everything messes over you. Everything goes wrong and you just turn flips, somersaults. So he says, I'm rejoicing because they're walking in the truth. We talked about last week, this word walking doesn't mean putting one step in front of the other. This word walking means it's a lifestyle for you. This word walking means that you are able to see the fruit on the tree. It's your lifestyle. It's your fruit. People can see your fruit. Your fruit is evident. It is clear who you serve. If someone has to ask you if you are a Christian in order for them to think you're a Christian, there's a problem. John says, I rejoice. I'm excited about the fact that you all are living according to the truth as it will be received the commandment. From the Father. God got all these commandments. He has all these commandments that He's given us, and we ought to walk therein. Verse number five. And now I plead with you, lady. <laughs> it says, And now I plead with you. I beg you. Now I plead with you. I'm begging you. Same term that, that Paul uses in, in Romans chapter 12 when he says, I beseech you, my brethren. 
that you live and make your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Here John follows the same pattern as Paul, and he says, I beg you, I beseech you, I plead with you. He says, I plead with you, lady. Here's his word, lady, again. I plead with you, church. I plead with you, church. I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you. He said, this is not new. <laughs> there are just some things you expect your children to do and know. And the reason why they, you expect them to do it and to know it is because they ought to be familiar with it because we've gone over this over and over again. And because, because it's not new to you, you ought to walk in this commandment. Verse 5, he says, now I plead with you. Lady, I plead with you, not as though a, I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning. We've been talking about love. What holds the church together is love. What holds people together is love. What holds marriages together is love. But it's the God type of love. It's the, it's the submissive type of love from the male as well as the female. It is, it is the type of love where you try to work harder than the other person to show your love. There ought to be a race for every couple, every friendship, every relationship, every father, daughter, every, you ought to show your love in such a way that it ought to be a competition. My mom has a way of being in competition with me as to whether her yard looks better than my yard. <laughs> so every now and then after I finish, I sh take a picture of the yard and send it to her. And one night I took a picture of a yard and I sent it to brother Ewan Miles. And he was like, hey, you took a picture of your house and sent it to him. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Can't you read between the lines? What's wrong with you? So what I do is I take a picture of my yard and send it to her to let her know that my yard has been getting some love. What about yours? <laughs> now, the problem that makes it one sided is the fact that when I go there, she works me in her yard. Now, I'm in competition with her, but I'm the one helping her beef up her yard. And that's, all right. and that's a problem. <laughs> that's, all right. that's unfair. It's unfair because we're in competition. And because we're in competition, I can't ever win if I'm always in her yard helping her in her yard. And her yard has all these beautiful yellow, green, blue flowers, pink flowers, all these, these flowers and mine is just greenery. But that's how it ought to be. We ought to be in competition to love each other. And then as we in competition to love each other, we ought to be in competition so much so until we help each other out. So I guess I got it, huh? Either I got it or I just do what mama tells me to do, one or the other. And she doesn't, it doesn't matter with her which one I, that motivates me. <laughs> just get it done. So, so John says that this is not a new commandment I'm telling you. I didn't write this new commandment unto you, but this is a commandment that's been from the beginning that we love one another. Right. We love one. Jesus says like this, people will know that you are my disciples based on your love for one another. Love is action. Love is proof. Love is demonstrative. Love is example. When you don't love somebody, you don't have to tell them you don't love them. Just take no actions. <laughs> love is an action word. You have to show it. And as you love somebody every now and then, that person ought to feel loved. They ought to know that you respect them. They ought to know that they can depend on you because I love you. We can depend on God. I'm telling you, we can depend on God. You may not be able to depend on men, but you can depend on God. 
You not, may not be able to depend on friends and family members, but you can depend on God. Because God loves you. He loves you with an unconditional love. He loves you so much, he gave you his very, very best gift. God loves you. He loves you in spite of you. In spite of your meanness. Back home, they were calling trifleness. I mean, some people just trifling. <laughs> what does trifling mean? Brother McGill, he's from back home. What does trifling mean? Hard headed, stand in trouble, just doing things over and over again. So when, we, when it comes to keeping the commandment of God, we ought not be trifling. <laughs> we ought not be hard headed. We ought not stay in trouble. What, is, what does trifling mean in Louisiana? We know what it means in Mississippi now. What does trifling mean? What does trifling mean in Texas? Trifling. But when, when they call you trifling, that's, that's like the bottom of the barrel there. <laughs> that's after they've talked to you over and over and over and over again. They have, they have, you know, we came up when you had to go get your own switch and you better not come back with a three foot, foot, three foot switch either. You better come back with a real switch. You had to go get your own switch. And every time you show up with a little bit of switch, they, they said, now that adds some more licks there. When we came up, I mean, we went to school all the time with whips on our legs, in our buttocks. Yeah. And then when we got to school, the teacher and the principal walked around with a paddle stuck down in his belt or in his back pocket. And every female teacher at the school would call either a coach, a principal, or assistant principal, any male on the hallway. Because we were trifling, <laughs> kept getting in trouble, kept being disrespectful until they, they thought some kind of way would beat, beat it out. They thought that licks made a difference. And I'm here to tell you today, prayer was taken out of school, whipping was taken out of school. Now we got guns in the school. They took prayer out of school. They took discipline out of school. And now they got AR-15 in school. Just the other day, I saw a, a picture of middle school children, ages, uh, grades five through seven, down, laying down in a gym auditorium with AR-15, a line, a row of them. And they teaching them how to operate it. They, sh they let them target practice in the gym at school, middle school children. Dr. King says, don't let anybody push you to the point where it makes you hate them. But I want to tell Dr. King today, he, they pushing us. <laughs> they, really, they really motivating us. Dr. King said, don't let anybody push you to the point where you get so mad until you hate them. He said, hate has no place. But let me tell you, in the 21st century, they can really push you. They can push, people can push you. They can really push you. Verse number six. Verse number five says we got to love one another. We have to love. And we can't fake love. It has to be genuine. Verse number six. This is love. What is love? That we walk according to his commandments. See, when we love each other, we obey God's commandments. When we love God, we obey God's commandments. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lamb. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. When we love God, we obey God's commandments. Regardless of how small of the commandments there are. People think because they're small commandments, we should ignore them. But the matter of fact is, if they are small commandments, you shouldn't have a problem with obeying them. Some people get to the point where they don't want to obey anything or anybody, any simple stuff. Let me just say to the youth of the New Beginning Church, 
If the police ask you to show him your ID, forget about your rights. Well, I don't have to show you no ID because I know my rights. You start off with no bruises on your face, no bruises on your back, no bruises on your legs. But because you did not show an ID, you got bruises everywhere now. So you have to get to a point where you obey somebody and it needs to be somebody in authority. I know cops are out of control. I know they stop you while driving while black, driving while brown. But at least when they pull you over, say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything else I can do? And don't be sarcastic about it. Your idea tonight is to get home safely. Is to get home better than you were when you left home. And I say better because you're listening to the word of God. You ought to be better when you leave here. You ought to be better than you were when you got here. And you want to return with no bruises. You want to return home with no gashes, no stitches, and no pine box. We have to tell our children, it, it's not worse to fight in the streets. Just comply. If, if you comply and you still get to beat down, you get a chance to live, that's all right. Just comply. I go through the whole thing here at the New Beginning Church. If you're in the front seat, your hands are in the air where they can be seen. You're not reaching for your wallet. You're not reaching for your, your, your phone. You're not calling anybody. You want to comply. Get home safely. Get home. And, and when you get home, your parents can deal with the rest of the stuff. Right or wrong? You, folk, folk, we can deal with stuff later on. You just get home safely. It's hard to deal with it. And it's hard for you to have a testimony if you're dead. And the text says, this is love if we walk according to his commandments. The analogy is very weak when you compare God to a police officer. But the analogy is because we like to look at things that we can see. God is the great authority. And when God gives us commandments, gives us directives, gives us instruction, we ought to just follow it. Just obey. Now, do we do wrong things? Yes. Do we disobey? Yes. That's why 1 John 1 and 9 says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and God is just to forgive us for our sin and to clean us us from all unrighteousness. In other words, we want to get home safely. Amen. We want to obey the commandments. We want to walk with God. He says this is love. What is love? If we live according to God's commandments, if we walk according to God's commandments, this is love. According to his commandments. His commandments are right here. You don't have to go look for them. You don't have to go tweet for them. You don't have to go Google for them. They are all right here in the 66 books. If there's anything else outside of the 66 books, uh, you still don't have this yet. <laughs> you know, some people study a lot of things and a lot of theology, but you haven't gotten past this yet. I, I used to wonder. How can preachers preach for 50 years in his only 66 books? Because God is still giving revelation, but the revelation is coming from the 66 books. If we get revelation from anything else or anybody else other than Christ, see, in these last days, God is speaking through us through the word through Christ Jesus. We got, we got, I hear Sister David say it all the time. Children need to know Jesus. Children act crazy because they don't know Jesus. Now, having said that, do Christian children act crazy? Yes. But Christian children have a limit. The Bible says you train up a child in the way they should go. When they get old, they will not depart from it. What he's saying is they ought to have a limit. 
They ought to shut some stuff down. The Holy Spirit helps them to shut stuff down. They want to walk in the commandments. In 1 John chapter 5, we looked at the fact that if a person continue in sin, habitually in sin, the question of salvation ought to come up. He says, because when you're born again, you cannot be convicted of sin and continue in that sin. You ought to feel some kind of way. When, you, when you're wrestling in sin and, and you're looking for a way out, the Bible says God will provide a way out for us. We ought to look for that way out. God, show me the way out. Lord, I really don't want to do this, but I feel like doing it. God, show me a way out. So we ought to look to obey the commandments. This is love. We obey the commandments because we love God. We love each other. The Bible also says that we ought to love other people like we love ourselves. We ought to love others the way we love ourselves. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment. It's not a new commandment. He already said it. This is commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, as you have heard from the beginning, you shall walk in it. So we have to walk in the truth, what's in the word, the commandments of God. We have to walk in love. If we don't walk in the truth, we're not being obedient unto God. Here John talks to these members of the church and he says, I'm excited, I'm delighted, I'm on fire, I have great joy because you all are walking in the truth of God just as the Father has commandment. And he said the whole church ought to be walking in it. The whole church. We ought to walk in the truth. We ought to walk in love. And we ought to do it well. John says that the word of God, the truth of God, goes right along with love. They are inseparable. You can't get a rid of one for the other. We have to have an authentic relationship with God in order to walk in his word. It has to be a real relationship, a real fellowship. We have to walk in his word. And his commandments are based on his word. And as we walk in his word, we walk in his commandments, we have proof that we are his based on our obedience unto him. Based on our obedience. Other people watching us. They're trying to see how obedient we are. Do we mess up? Yeah. Are they going to point fingers when you mess up and say, I told you he wasn't all he cracked up to be. Boy, they got a field day out on preachers right now. They got a field day out on Christians right now. And they're looking for every little thing. We prove our obedience to him by demonstrating love toward one another. Love is an unlimited resource. And it is readily available to us. God has an unlimited resource that is readily available to us So much so until God comes in and helps us out to love folk. Do you know a person that you wouldn't love if you weren't Christian? (laughs) Do you know one, two, three, four, five people that that if you weren't born again, you wouldn't have any love for them? I got a bunch of them. If you won't confess, I will. I got a bunch of them. Let me tell you, it was from... 2016 to 2020, it was very hard to love everybody. you get that one when you get home. It, it was hard. It was so hard until I had to trust God to help me to love. Amen. Have you ever had to trust God? Mm-hmm. Lord, help me. I'm not talking about trust God for food, clothes, and shelter. I'm talking about trust God to help you love somebody. Yeah. Lord, I got to trust you on this one. John said, this is not a new commandment I'm telling you. This is this is thing that, that we've been teaching you from the beginning of time. Love. The whole civil rights movement was built on a platform of love. When you look at 
the bridge crossing in Selma. And you see John Lewis and other brothers and sisters just take a massive beating on Bloody Sunday. And they didn't even hit back. Let me tell you, some of the children right now, Generation Z, Generation X, uh, some of the children from, from the millennium generation, they couldn't handle it. Matter of fact, they'll tell you, we ain't our parents, we'll mess you up. The, the civil rights movement in the march was one that dealt with love. The civil rights movement, here we are, many years later, and the civil rights movement is different, but it deals with violence. But it's still a movement. We're still fighting for civil rights. And only God can fix it. Only God can make a difference. Only God can strengthen us. And only God can make us who we need to be, a loving group of people. So his unlimited resource of love is available to us. It is, it is effective in furthering the word of God, the truth of Jesus Christ. It is readily available. God has, has given us benefits, and one of those benefits is love. Love one another. And we show that love. We demonstrate that love. We, we know that love is a reality and it can be obtained. Your neighbor, you can love him. Your boss, you can love her. Love him. Love her. You can, you can get to love people because God is able to make things well with you. It's only when we are selfish about it that we can't follow the principles of God. And they are not, they're not easy all the time. It's not always all the time that we can just jump up in the morning and say, oh, I love that person that stabbed me in the back last night. And sometimes it's not even easy to, to love Christians. But the Bible says, if we love the truth, if we love the Father, if we love the Son, if we have grace, mercy, and peace, if it's going to happen, we got to love the commandments of God. We got to love one another. Jesus, great example. Stephen, great example. Jesus dies on Calvary. While he's dying, he stopped long enough to say, Lord, forgive them. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they're doing. Father, forgive them. He's praying for the folk that's killing him. Can you do that? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He could have called for the angels and come down off the cross, but he loved us so much until he went to the cross Stayed up there, died for us, buried in a barber tomb, rose early that third day morning because that's love. that's love. And another thing is, not only did he love the people that killed him, he loved us who had not been born yet. And check this out. And he knew we wouldn't love him. How do I know we didn't love him? Because we won't keep his commandments. The text declares that if you love him, you keep his commandments. Stephen, great example. We read Acts chapter 7. We look at Stephen, one of the deacons that was made a deacon in Acts chapter 6. Stephen, one of the first deacons, he's being stoned to death because he's preaching the word of God. He's preaching the truth. Let me tell you, the truth will get you in trouble. And I'm not talking about just telling the truth on a person because sometimes the truth will hurt people. And when they hurt people and your motivation is to hurt people, you ought to keep your mouth closed. Prime example, girl, you know that boy over there, Sarah's boy going to jail again. That's gossip. That's not just truth. It is true that he's going to jail again, but it's your motive that you have to check. 
You got to check your motive. What's your motive? Don't you know that that boy never been any good? It may be true. He may stay in trouble. He may be trifling. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is you have arterial motives, and that is to make one look bad. When the Bible talks about truth, it's talking about this word of God. It is the only truth. It is infallible. It has no errors. It is truth. And there is no truth like this truth. Stephen, being stoned to death, he looks up toward heaven. He says, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Stephen, Acts chapter 6, he becomes a deacon. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He's, he's apt to teach. He's walking in the word of God. He stands up and he proclaims the word of God. They stones him to death in Acts chapter 7. And he stops dying just to ask God, God forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus was so pleased with Stephen's death until the Bible says that Jesus, who sits on the right hand of the father, Stephen looks up toward heaven and Jesus is standing up in approval to the attitude and the love that Stephen is showing forth in Acts chapter seven. Is Jesus standing up for you? <laughs> is Jesus standing up because because of your love for another person? Is Jesus standing up because you're, you're unselfish in your being? Is Jesus standing up because you love somebody enough, even your enemies enough, to forgive them and ask God to forgive them? Jesus did it. Stephen did it. God gives us the power, the strength to do it. The door of the church is open. Invitations extended. This is a moment where you can get to know Jesus. Right here, right now, you can get to know Jesus the Christ. The door is open. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. You can get to know him tonight all for yourself. All you have to do is trust the story, the forgiveness story of Jesus Christ. Over 2,000 years ago, he gave up the ghost. He died for you. He died for me on a hill called Calvary. Jesus the Christ, Jesus gave his life for you. It was a voluntary death. No man took his life. He laid his life down for his friends. He laid his life down for us. They took him off the cross after they killed him. They laid him in a barber tomb. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead because he loves us. And he didn't just love us because we were good. He didn't love us because we were kind. He did not love us because we were spiritual. He loved us in spite of us. You can receive that Jesus tonight. Just trust this Jesus. If this is you and you've never received Christ as your Savior, this is your moment. Just bow your head with me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Just repeat these simple words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you prayed this prayer now, you are born again. And when you die, you're on your way to heaven. And the angels will rejoice just as John says he rejoiced over the church. We believe that you're on your way to heaven. And if you're without a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Where Jesus is the captain of the church. Where Jesus is the great head of the church. We want you to join us. Let us know, inbox us, and let us know that you need a church home. We will welcome you to the New Beginning Church. Let us know that you received Jesus Christ 
as a result of this broadcast. And we'll be glad to rejoice with you and celebrate with you. In Jesus name. When we thank God for who he is and what he's already done, we serve the awesome and the mighty God, Jesus the Christ. And we worship him here today. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can give by three means. One, if you're in the sanctuary, you can come and bring your offering now. Or you can give by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting, period, Jesus at yahoo.com or you can mail in your offering you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 that's P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas Seven seven four five nine. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. 9 a.m. sharp for our Sunday school where the men will be passing out the word of God. Amen. Brother Miles and Brother Whitlock will be passing out the word of God in Sunday school. And then immediately after Sunday school at 1030 a.m., we will have our worship service. We want you to come and join us. Be a part of our service. We are back in the clubs. We are back at the parks. We are back at sporting events. Now we need to be back at the church house. Come and join us on Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. Let me take this time to thank all of you who contributed, all of you who supported, and all of you who prayed for us for my 18th anniversary. Amen. 18 years of pastoring the New Beginning Church. Thank you so much for being a part in whatever role that you played. I want to thank our youth our directors, our musicians, and I want to thank our youth for a powerful presentation on Sunday. Again, thank you for joining us here tonight. God bless you and God keep you as our prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Now, Lord, we come praying for those who need you to heal them. We pray for Sister Lydia and Darrington, Father God. We ask you to touch in the name of Jesus. Strengthen as only you can. Bless, Lord, as only you can. And Father God, we thank you for a successful surgery. Now, Lord, we ask you to, to put her body on the men. Deliver her speedily. And bless her life. Lord, we pray for those who are confused, those who don't know which way to turn, those who do not have good faculties of their mind. We ask you to bless and heal. Lord, I believe that you can regulate hearts and minds. We ask you to do it in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, we pray for the New Beginning Church. Continue to guide us, lead us, and protect us. Lord, we look to you, Father God, to give us favor in this cold, dark, and dismal world. Bless us this day, Father God, that we will move forth and reach souls for you. Bless us, Father God, that we will continue to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, in dominion. Until we meet again, the church says, Amen. Amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Amen.